<laughs> and I get it. Well, I don't even know why I'm up here because Dan just gave you a sermon. <laughs> With those two scriptures, we received, I'm turning this around, so we we'll have to turn it back. We received a lot of hope hearing those two scriptures, just knowing that any battle that you're going through, that God is there. You know, you're praying, you're saying, God, just, you know, deliver me from my enemies, from malicious talk, from whatever somebody's going to put up against me. Psalm 27 encourages us to wait for the Lord. So often we want to get ahead of the Lord, but he is bringing something to our attention where he's asking us to just sit and wait on me because I'm trying to show you something about me. And we never need to miss that. We need to sit and watch that and listen. Paul refers to our tendency to try to control the outcomes when it, we're in Philippians. Try to control the outcomes. Don't we, wouldn't we love to do that? And boy, what a mistake that would be if we got everything at our outcome. Because we can't see everything going on around us and, and everything that is taking place. But God can. And he says, wait on me. Don't try to control the outcomes. Let me take care of it. Just sit back and rest in me. And rest in me because I've got something good for you. That's good news. So I'm done. Not really. Let's keep going. Because <laughs> our sermon text today is from Luke 13. Luke 13. And it gives us an inside look at the heart of God. God's heart for us. God's heart for us. I call this sermon God's heart for us. How about that? Okay. So it's God's heart for us and his relationship. He wants to restore us to the right relationship, back to the right relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit by restoring us to our best selves. Do you like that word? Anybody want to be their best self? are their best self in God, because there's a be best self in the world where we think we're like our, at our best, but there's a best self in God's eyes. And that's where we want to be in the center of, because that's where we get our hope. That's where we get our peace. That's where we get our joy. That's where we get all those fruits of the spirit that even in the storm, we can walk in peace. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much, Lord, that you are God all by yourself. You don't need anything for, from us. But Lord, you said, if we will pray, you will hear us. Lord, you say that you will deliver us. Lord, you say that you will heal us. You have lots of promises that you give us, Lord, and we're going to hold you to them. We thank you for this time that we have today. We ask God that you send out your word and divide it up in all the many different ways that it needs to be heard today. Because that's what your word does. It speaks directly to our hearts. We ask that in your mighty name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. You know, um, for those who don't know, I'm also a music teacher, but all of you up here know that, but maybe out in the Zoom world, they might not know that. And welcome to all of our guests today. I'd like to say that. Um, I have some challenging classes over the years with challenging students. And for some reason, because I know they're not watching this when it's recorded. <clears throat> I'm not saying any names though. But for some reason, the teacher will always place the most challenging student up front. <laughs> so when they come in, uh, they're the first ones I see. I know they're a challenge. So it's like, <sighs> you try to smile and, and you, are, you know what's about to happen. You know that you're about to go through the ringer with the child as soon as they come in. But, you know, that was years ago. I've gotten better at this. So as I got better at it, I realized the one thing you can do for uh, anyone who may be struggling is to let them know you see them and to say their name and to say, we're going to have a great day today like prophesize over them, you know, <laughs> prophesy. We're going to have a great day today. I'm looking forward. I'm so glad you're here today. We're going to have a super day today. You know, when I first started doing that, they looked at me like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but then they started to walk in what they were hearing. They started to walk in what they were hearing, and it became a better day. There was one teacher I know. There's one teacher I know, Mr. I. I can say his name because he'll love it that I said his name at church today. Um, Mr. I is retired now. And Mr. I, I have him come in as my sub because the kids love Mr. I. He's this Italian guy. And um, he 
always tells them stories. I leave very good plans for my students. <laughs> he never uses them, <laughs> ever. He's, he's just as well as told me, stop leaving plans because I'm not going to do them. And I have to adjust because when I come back, the kids are like, we had so much fun with Mr. I, and he gave us a treat. I said, Mr. I is not allowed to give you treats. And I tell them to tell me. If Mr. I gives you a treat, you tell me because I'm going to get it. And as soon as I come back in the class, Mr. I gave us a treat. And I'm like, I'm going to get him. They just bust out laughing. They fall out. And they tell him, Ms. Grace said you're not supposed to give us a treat. And he says, I know. And he just keeps doing it. So they love Mr. I. And he's a great storyteller. But when he was the classroom teacher of his own class, people wondered why Mr. I's kids did so well. All these other teachers given homework tough as nails. And Mr. I, you would hear laughter coming from his class. You would um, have kids that come back. I mean, after they graduate, they become teachers and they come back to thank Mr. I because it was Mr. I's um, love. It was Mr. I's uh, encounter relationship with them. Because the first thing he does at every year of his class is he gives everybody a nickname. And so, and he, of course, never forgets it. He gives them a nickname like Piccolo Joe. Come on up, Piccolo Joe. Like, you know, and everybody gets a nickname. They all feel in community with him. It was about relationship. And his kids always did well on tests. And no one could understand because he never sent home homework, which was unheard of at that time. He never sent home homework. But they worked so hard for him. They just loved him so much. They worked so hard for him. So I'm going to tell him to watch this so he can hear how I talked about him. But he was a prime example of relationship and the importance of it. God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit is in a relationship. And relationship to him is so important. That's why he seeks to be in relationship with us. Relationships a big deal, seeing the person, and he sees us. But do we always see him? Do we see him the way we should? Or do we kind of, thanks, God. Thanks for answering that prayer. Moving on. And we don't call him until the next issue comes up. God's a God of relationships. So I'm going to read this scripture. Luke 13, 31 through 35. This is the Lord Jesus' uh, lament over Jerusalem, lamenting. I've been hearing that word a lot. That means the, the, the pain, the anguish, uh, the sorrow that he felt, okay? At that very hour, some Pharisees, this is the ESV version, the English Standard Version. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, go and tell that fox. For some reason, I love that. I love that. <laughs> Jesus, yes. You go and tell that fox. Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow. And the third day, I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the following day. For it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Here's the lament. The city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. Ooh. Last week, we learned that Jesus defeated the devil when the devil tempted him. He said no. How many times? Three. Three times he said no to the devil. And that was to teach us to say yes to God and no to those things that keep us away from God. So that's something to put in your memory. Say yes to God, but no to those things, which is what the season of Lent and Easter preparation is all about. Turning to God, saying yes to the things that bring you closer to him. So we're saying no to those other things. We're drawing closer. Everything about our Christian life arises out of relationship. Everything about it. We're sealed in the unity of the spirit. 
We're sealed in the unity of the spirit. But here's this group of Pharisees, just like always happens with Jesus. People are asking the wrong question, giving the wrong statement, saying something that he has to completely turn it around, turn it upside down on him and say, look, you're asking the wrong question. Are you telling me the wrong thing? You're not paying attention to the right thing. What we're learning about Jesus in this passage is what we're going to look at. Whenever you look at a passage, you should say to yourself, what does this tell me about Jesus? That's what you should say to yourself. Yeah. Because every scripture is telling you something about Jesus. His heart, um, the way he works, the way God works, everything is telling you something about Jesus. It's not just a bunch of different prophets writing down things. It's the inspired word of God. It's telling you something God wants you to know, okay? And so what are we learning? We're learning that Jesus is not concerned with Herod trying to kill him. He's not concerned about that. Jesus doesn't go, oh, thanks, gotta go. <laughs> No, no, no. He doesn't say that. Notice, as usual, he doesn't answer their question, just like the guys who said, can we build three um, monuments here, one for you and one for the other prophets? And, and, and Jesus just keeps going. And then God swoops in and covers him and says, look, listen to my son. Listen to my son. Don't get off the subject. Stay focused. And Jesus says, I'm here to tell you that I am the right question. Do you think Jesus needs protecting? That Jesus needs the protection of the Pharisees? Jesus doesn't need their protection. Not at all. But they, were they trying to protect him? Or were they trying to get rid of him? There were some Pharisees who were listening, but there were others who were like, hey, you should go. Because uh, Pharisees did not like prophets. They didn't like prophets in Jerusalem, period. They were like, get out, prophet, get out. But there had to be something about Jesus. There had to be something about Jesus that he was just no ordinary prophet. That when he stands in front of you and he's talking, he's talking with a different authority than the other prophets. They had authority, but they didn't have, they weren't God. Because Jesus was fully God and fully man. So that's not what they, that's not what we have there. He changes the question. He doesn't need their protection. He also lets them know who's in charge. Once again, I'm not fearful. I'm the one in charge here. I'm the one in charge here. My father's in charge here. My father's in charge here. So he directs them, you go tell that fox for me. Uh, I think I'm going to use that in everyday language this week. When somebody says, we need to, you go tell that fox for me. <laughs> he lets them know trusting Herod would be the wrong thing to do. That's what he's basically letting them know. It's the wrong thing to do. Let's notice what he does next. He says, listen here, listen to me. Don't tell me, listen to me. Listen to me. Don't tell me that, but listen to what I'm about to say to you. Listen, I'm casting out demons. So what does that tell you about me? If the Pharisees were listening, he's casting out demons. What does that tell you about Jesus? He says, um, I'm performing miracles today and tomorrow. He's letting them know this isn't just a one and done thing. I'm going to keep doing this. What does that tell you about Jesus? I'm the one who brings healing. And who does the healing come from? Hmm. What does that tell you about his relationship with God the Father? Healing, cures being performed day in and day out. His relationship with his Father. It should tell you something about Jesus. You see, he's telling them, and he strongly invites them to, uh, to listen carefully. He's inviting them to listen carefully about what he's saying. But can you imagine, can you see this? La, 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 I'm not listening, Jesus. La, 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 I don't want to hear what you have to say, Jesus. How many times is that us? La, 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 I'm not listening, Lord. I know what I'm about to do is not good for me. La, 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 I don't care. I want it right now. <laughs> Plugging up our spiritual ears. I don't want to repent. I'm just fine. 
I don't want to change the way I'm going. I'm just fine. This is okay. I'm in control. Jesus is inviting us to something better, to something better. He says, on the third day, I finished my work. And you had to believe, if you heard that, well, the third day is just in a little bit. So he'll be finished and out of here, if you're just listening with those ears. And then maybe after, afterwards, isn't that Nicodemus went to visit him? And Nicodemus was asking that question because he had heard, what are, you, what are you talking about? What are you talking about on the third day? But can you imagine after he was crucified and he rose on the third day, some of them had to think back. He said that was going to happen. He said that was going to happen. How many believers would that bring to him? By just giving them that little nugget that they would have to think about later. How many nuggets have we been given that we see fulfilled later and we go, oh, Jesus, I get it now. I get it. I get what you were trying to tell me. They're reflecting. He's making himself the issue. He's turning the tables on him. He's exercising his authority. And he wants to get them to pay attention because that's what God has been telling since that baptism. What did he say? At the baptism of Jesus, you are my son. He said, you are my son. He let Jesus know, I got you. But then at the transfiguration, he's got to tell others, this is my son. Listen to him. Listen to him. Setting up the importance of who Jesus is of who Jesus is. Don't get caught up in the nonsense. So now we read about Jesus's heart. When he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, when it's repeated in that way, could you imagine God saying to you, or I'll imagine him saying to me, I won't call out anybody, Tamar, Tamar. Mm. <laughs> Just agony. I'm sure there's more agony. I'm, Maybe I'm not as bad as Jerusalem, but it's the same point. <laughs> he says, you kill, the, he has this longing and agony. The city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. See, he's already anticipating what's going to happen. Kills the prophets. Stones them. Jesus is, um, he's trying to get the people to respond to what he's saying. He's giving them the words to get them to respond to what he's saying and respond to, especially to a different kind of leadership. So we're always given words to get us to respond to his leadership, but we don't always respond. He tells us more. He tells us of his heart for us, no matter what, his heart for us. He says, I desire to gather you as a mother hen. Did you ever, I saw this picture once Maybe you saw it. there was a fire and this hen had wrapped herself around her babies. She died. She was burned. But when they lifted her up, her babies were still alive. She had covered them. So that, I always remember that picture. Jesus is covering us. Jesus died so that we might live so that we might live his heart for us. Those who belong to Jerusalem and of course to its temple, his desire is to protect them. Those who worship God and who are worshiped in, in Jerusalem, his very presence is represented there in the holy, holy of temples. It's represented there, but he's trying to get them to see him, see me. Oh, how often I've desired, he said, to gather your children together. We see the heart of Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit desiring to gather, and yet the resistance to him. I've got this love for you, and you're not accepting it. I want to gather you, but you're resisting me. We see his brightness in his heart, but they're rejecting it. I just speak to us today. How often have we rejected it? Or do you know someone who's rejecting it? The love that Jesus has for them, and yet the rejection that we give, resisting God's grace. Now, he was in person, and they were resisting it. 
just imagine us today. You know, I, 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 would, I would love to think if Jesus was around today, I would follow him and I would be his best disciple. We got a great example of what the disciples did who followed Jesus. And they were just as human and flawed and his grace and his love, he loved them. He loved them just where they are, just like he loves us, just where we are. But as we always say, his desire is that we don't stay. He's got so much more in store for us. We see his heart. Um, it reminds us of the owner of the field. Remember, there's an owner of a field and they sent their servants and they didn't kill the servants. Who did they kill? They killed the son. They killed the son. What do we see when we look into the heart of God, who is the triune God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? What do we see? We see there's a willingness to give us everything, everything right up to himself. Come on, folks. He gave everything. He's giving us everything. His heart for being about his father's business. We see that about Jesus. I'm not scared of you. You tell that fox, hey, I'm about my father's business. Trusting his father's word and keeping his focus and leaning back into him. He, Jesus isn't doing this on his own strength. We can't do things on our own strength. He's leaning back into him. He was saying, Lord, you do it. I'll just, I'll just say the words that you give me. I'll just do the job that you sent me to do. I wish I was like that all the time. I'm like that quite a bit, and this is honest and true. So, again, not perfect. I'm like that often, but sometimes I might miss it. I might miss my assignment that day because I was too distracted by something else. Too distracted. But if I lean into him, quick story, little boy at school. I have a student teacher now. Best thing I ever had, Anna. <laughs> Anna. She is so good. She's from Case. She is a, just an excellent young lady who's going to make an excellent music teacher. So now she's pretty much taken over my class. Yay. So what do I do? I sit at my desk and I watch Anna teach. And then when she's finished, I, um, you know, when the class leaves, she, um, she, um, I'll tell her different things or say, how do you feel about that? And we'll talk through the lesson and everything. And she's just doing a, a fantastic job. So I'm sitting in one of the classes and this uh, young man is near my desk. He's a third grader. He's near my desk. He gets up at one point, he looks over at me and he said, what do you do? <laughs> he says, cause she's up there. <laughs> what are you doing? I said, I'm her supervisor. I said, and I'm, I'm, I'm watching, <clears throat> I'm watching what she does. And then, you know, she and I talk about it after she said, and then so he said, oh, so you do nothing. <laughs> I've been telling that story to every teacher everywhere. Oh, so you do nothing. I would like that to be what's said about me and Jesus. Oh, I do nothing. It's my father and my Lord who do everything, Jesus. Yeah, but just remember, just remember that young third grader. I won't say his name. <laughs> oh, you do nothing. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I guess you're right. And I'm kind of enjoying it. Somebody said, and you should have said, and I get paid for it too. <laughs> That's what I should have said. Yeah. We're trusting God by leaning back into him. And we know Jesus is showing us that he loves us where we are. Jerusalem's all messed up. And he loves Jerusalem where they are, just like he loves us where we are. That's good news. He wants to restore us into a right relationship. He wants Jerusalem restored back to a right relationship. So there's this child psychologist, maybe I'll use this on that young man, named Alice Miller. And she said, she talked about how we're all called to be an enlightened witness, okay? People who through kindness and tenderness and focused attention of love return people to themselves. And in the process, you return to yourself. I like that. And in the process, you return to yourself. By showing love to someone else, you return to who you're supposed to be. That makes sense to me. That makes sense to me. 
Jesus longed for Jerusalem to hold up a mirror to himself. You know that song? I'm starting with the man in the mirror. I'm asking him to change his ways. You know, I got to sing every now and then. <laughs> to hold up a mirror to themselves and to see, to see themselves. But really, as he saw. God's asking us to hold up a mirror to ourselves and see ourselves as he sees us. Because I got to tell you, when I'm looking in the mirror, it's just to straighten up and to fix everything, right? But God sees us. Maybe make that an exercise this week. Get, get in the mirror and go, God, how do you see me? I want to know and stand there for a minute. It's going to be awkward because nobody likes to stand in the mirror that long. <laughs> you know, I've, I've avoided mirrors sometimes. It's like, oh, don't look. <laughs> how does God see us? How does God see you? Unfortunately for Jerusalem and for humanity in general, we want to fight against our perceived enemies, and we want to forego compassion. We see that happening in the world right now. We see it playing out in real time, and the world is terrified by what we see. But this has been going on for a while. This one is being shown. We're at a time where you can actually see it happen, and it's terrifying. It's hard to go about my everyday life when I know what somebody's going through someplace else, when it's in front of my face. You can avoid it on TV and say, I don't want to see it, but we cannot stick our head in the sand and act like it's not happening if it doesn't drive you to your knees. If we don't have compassion. Because when we live that kind of way with no compassion, we fail to live our lives in peace, joy, and love. We fail to live our lives in peace, joy, and love when we don't have compassion for someone else. Jesus' compassion, his lament for Jerusalem, how we should be responding. Then he says, see, your house is left to you, and I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. What this basically tells us is he kind of leaves you to your own devices when you're not in kinship with him. Go ahead. Be who you're going to be. Do what you're going to do. I'm not going to force you. I'm not going to force you to accept my love. I'm going to love you anyway. You think about your children who do that to you. I hate you. Okay, but I love you. Get on my nerves. I'm just saying things I've heard before. <laughs> yeah, but I love you. That's God with us. I'm turning my back on you and I'm never coming back for years. Yeah, I'll be here. I'll be here. He outlines what's going to happen to Jerusalem. He tells them what's going to happen. Because Jerusalem was taken over. He was like, prophesied. Two times was it taken over in that time, 68 AD uh, and uh, 587 BC, all those BCs, ADs. And look what's happening now. Satan said in the Bible last week, I own all this. This has been given over to me. I can give it to whoever I want to. I don't know why I just caught that. You know how the Bible, something pops out at you? That popped out at me. I can give it to whoever I want. No, thank you. He weeps over us. Jesus weeps over us. Last story. I was with a mother this week. And she was crying for her son. And the bad choices he was making. I mean, she was weeping hard. And she says, I don't know what to do. He is making so many bad decisions. I don't want him to, to not succeed. I don't want this. I mean, just thinking about it, I almost well up in tears because I could feel what she was saying. Her desire for her son was so that he would have a good life so that he wouldn't make mistakes. And she was pouring that out and she didn't care who was hearing it at that moment. 
And there were a few of us who gathered around. That's God's desire for us. I don't want you to go away that's just not going to be good for you. I don't want you to have to suffer. Tell you what I'll do. I'll send my son to die for you so you'll have eternal life. I want you to turn to me. I want you to be there for me. I want to be there for you. And we know Jesus will first hear, Hosanna, pierced, risen. Jesus will first hear, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord when he enters Jerusalem. When he enters Jerusalem, right? What's the next thing? Crucify him. Crucify him just a few days later. And what's the last thing? He has risen. He has risen. That short amount of time, we're going to be reliving that time. That short amount of time, you go tell that fox, I'm about my father's business. So when I read to you right now, that scripture one more time, but I'm going to read it from the message. See what pops out to you now as we conclude this. Just then, some Pharisees came up and said, run for your life. Herod's on the hunt. He's out to kill you. Jesus said, tell that fox that I have no time for him right now. Today and tomorrow, I'm busy clearing out the demons and healing the sick. The third day, I'm wrapping things up. Besides, it's not proper for a prophet to come to a bad end outside Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, killer of prophets, abusers of message of the messengers of God. How often I've longed to gather you, your children, gather your children like a hen, her brood safe under her wings. But you refused and you turned away. And now it's too late. You won't see me again until the day you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of God. Amen. 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 That brings us to communion. Relationship, relationship, relationship. God is all about relationship. And communion helps us to identify the relationship. Thank you, Betty. We're passing out communion here. I hope you have yours at home on Zoom. As we're passing it out, I want you to think about anything that you need to address with God before you take it. And remember, please, there's no, I can cross over, I can cross the line if I just, if I just tell him hard enough, thank you, that I'm sorry. If I say it like I really mean it, he'll forgive me. God's chasing after us. And he's saying, just say, you say, just say it. I already forgive you. I sent my son for you. You can't say it hard enough for me to forgive you more. You can't do it. That's good news. That's hope. That's the relationship where we want to be. As the body of Christ, the Holy Spirit joins us to Christ to share not only in his communion with the Father, but also in his mission from the Father. That's what we're saying when we take communion. We're joining in mission. The communion of the body is the church that shares in the continuing work of Jesus Christ for the sake of the world. When you take communion, we always think of it for ourselves. It's beyond that. We're taking it for the sake of everybody else, too. Really. It's not that we're standing in their steed, but it's just, just that we're pouring out that compassion to the world, to a world that desperately needs it, to a world that desperately needs it. So I'm going to give you a, a couple of 10 seconds to take time to address with God, a short prayer of talking to him, confessing to him before we take this. So take a few seconds to speak to God on your own.
Amen. And as we take the bread, we're reminded that there are people right now hiding who can't do this right now. That's really all around the world. There are people, there are wars going on that we don't talk about in other places. There are people in danger in other places, and yet we sit in peace in the comfort of our home or in the comfort of this room, this space. Lord, we thank you that we're able to take this communion, that we're able to have compassion, Lord, your compassion, because we can't do it on our own. It can only come from you. So as we take this bread, you said, be reminded, take, eat, this is my body given for you. And then you took the cup, Lord. You said, as often as we do this, do this in remembrance of you. May we never forget. May we never forget. May it not just be a season, but may it be every day we remember the sacrifice that was made for us. Jesus said, this is my blood poured out for the remission of your sins. Blessed Lord, in your name we pray. I pray that communion never gets old for you, that you never feel so unworthy that you say, I shouldn't take it today. I need you to run to the communion table because I need to run to the communion table. We need to be there, present with the Lord. Let's pray as we close out. Father in heaven, we come before you, Lord. We are grateful and we are thankful. We are thankful that we are here today and we sit in peace. Lord, we never want to forget those who don't. Father God, we thank you for the, the pouring out, the heart that you have for us, the love that you have for us. Lord, may we run to you and not turn away from you. And in this season, Father, reveal to each and every one of us what we need to see in ourselves, that you're trying to, to get us to see and to change. We thank you, God, for you are a loving God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.